just happy to be here this morning. Amen. Um, even though we may not all be gathered here together, um, for those of us who's gathered, remember it says in the word that when two or three are gathered in his name, he is in our midst. Amen. Um, so before we just get into worship, I just um, want to read from us um, from Revelations 4. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Um, and in Revelations 4, it also talks about the 24 elders um, as they casted their crowns before the throne. And this morning, um, I know that we... Um, we read and we declare from Revelations 4 uh, many times, but it is still our prayer that God, that we would desire to see you each and every single day, um, this morning and every morning, that we would see you as holy God, that you would show us further and more of who you are, God, and that we, just like the 24 elders and the saints in the throne room, Lord, would really just abandon ourselves and our crowns, Father, before you and at your feet, God, that we desire to say that you are worthy of it all, God. You are so worthy, God. You are so so desiring, um, so deserving, God, of our love, Lord, of all the glory, the honor, and the power that we can give to you today, Lord. And so from this morning, God, and we just want to sing from this place in our hearts, Lord, where we will just surrender everything before you, God, that we will be so willing, God, just so that we can see, um, see you, Father, just so that we can move your heart, God. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. 
invite us to continue to proclaim the name of God because his name is worthy, his name is holy, his name is deserving of all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. So I just invite us all today to just lift up the name of God, to lift up the name of Jesus, to sing out your own song today. There is a song in your heart that is written in your heart that he desires for you to sing, that he desires for you to speak, that he desires for you to pray. Today, lift up your, your scripture today, whatever it may be, just lift it up to him because he is worthy, he is holy, he is worthy of it all. God, you are worthy of it all, so we just lift up to you our praise, our worship, all the honor and all the glory because you are worthy.
Lord, you are worthy of everything. You are so holy, God. We just praise you. We just give you everything, God. We love you so much, God. this tendency, God. We feel this pulling to just move your heart, to just give you all our praise, to give you all our love, to give you all our affection. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, Jesus, Jesus. 
Turn my heart away You 
lay it all down for you, God. To show you our affection, to show you our devotion, to show you our commitment, God. We just want to move you, God. So we give you everything. We give you our praises. We give you our body, God. The title of my exhortation, for some reason I have a, a title today, it's called Giving Generously. Um, and Sister Lilita alluded to what we um, are learning as far as like Bible studies, the Word of God, that we need to practice it. It's not just about memorization or just knowing all these things intellectually, but really living it out and practicing it. And um, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 11, verse 11, uh, in the prior verses, we all use this scripture where it says, reap generously and you will, uh, sow generously and you will reap generously and give um, with a joyful heart, right? Uh, in summary, cheerful heart. But in verse 11, here it's what it says, <clears throat> In AMPC, it says, thus you will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous. Uh, I'm going to say that again. And you will be enriched in all things and in all in every way so that you can be generous and your generosity as it is administered by us, Paul talking here, will bring forth thanksgiving to God. You will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous. It's not a past tense, but it's looking forward. In the TPT version, it says you will be abundantly. You will be. So I'm, I'm emphasizing here the the tense, you will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. It doesn't say only on your mission trip or when you're giving at church, but on every occasion as what Sister Lilita already gave us examples. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks. So that's why I said her. Her example is uh, like a prelude to this offering because, you know, with her example, with giving that tip to the driver, it cost him. He may have not said, thank you, God, like in front of Sister Lilita, but I'm sure he had a heart full of thanksgiving because of what she did. And so you will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. And so why giving generously? So we all know this. I have three points. Give because it is our, we give because it is our response to the love of God for, for us because he gave us his life generously. Amen. We all know that we give because it is our response to our love for God. Number two, we give because God loves a cheerful giver. Like I have said from the prior scripture from second Corinthians chapter nine. And then we give because we know that when we give or so generously, we reap generously. Right. So practical way. Here's an example. Um, I wanted to give because this is common when we go out. Uh, like say for instance dinner or lunch with our friends or family uh, we invite our friends or family you say oh ilibri kita right like we're so generous in giving um, our money to treat other people ilibri what is it you guys understand that libre uh, I'll treat you out to lunch yeah take you out and then um, like you know you have that already like pre decision that you're going to give uh, and then when you're already paying at lunch say for instance sister Miles or and brother Ted sister Miles said oh uh, kita brother Ted lunch tayo okay and then because brother Ted also is very generous at lunch he's like no sister Miles I'll pay for it 
right? Um, but because Sister Mel's already said, oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Next time, kana lang brother dead. Ako ilibri mo, ha? siya. You know, she, she has, she already said it, so take, I'll take your word for it. You, you pay for it. But even if he's, you know, generous enough to say, I'll, I'll do it, you know, you, you do it because you already said it. And so, here, what, what am I trying to say? When we say say things that we we say, okay, I'll do this, I'll give this for for whatever. On every occasion, we give generously. It doesn't matter if someone says, I'll do it. Let them do it next time. Do what you said you, you were going to do. Amen. Um, it's not because of the circumstance that because he said he will do it. Yes, we will bless them, and next time he will pay for it. But you know, we we give because we already said we will give. Um, and uh, one of the things I learned is tipping. When you guys go to restaurants, you know how like you tip based on the service that they give? I don't know if many of you guys do that, but... <laughs> so you don't give because it's not based on their tipping. It is based on, on, on you, on, on your response to how they treated you. But... The world is, I will tip based on how they serve me. But really, you tip, I mean, like I said, her exhortation is like a prelude to this offering. You see them how God sees them. So maybe they're not going through, they're going through some stuff. And so they're not serving you the way you wanted to. And so... Would you tip them zero because of that service? Or would you tip them based on how God sees them or how you are? Actually, it's really about you. It's not about the other person. Whatever you do to other people is because of, not because of who they are, but of who you are. Who are you in Christ? So like I said, her offering is, is the prelude to, I mean, her exhortation is a prelude to this Offering. So we don't give based on what others did or did not do. We don't give based on what you have, your bank account, because like what that scripture said, you will be enriched so that you will give abundantly. So it doesn't matter how much you have on your paycheck or your bank account, you give because you are generous. You are generous because God said you are generous. He will enrich you with uh, everything that you will need. We give because of who you are. And that is you are a generous giver. Because first and foremost, God gave his life. Jesus gave his life generously for us so that we may become generous giver. We may not be giving our lives because that takes a lot of uh, you know, it's life, blood, right? But, you know, in, in our efforts, our time, our money, that's how we give. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the offering that we're about to receive. Bless it, multiply it, and um, multiply it a thousand times more than what you have promised, God. And so we just thank you for everyone that... Um, is a giving and those who cannot give father we pray that you would supply them enrich them in all ways in every occasion that they will give abundantly lord jesus in jesus name amen seeing god as he is seeing god as he is this is the greatest need of each christians today realigning our thoughts about god with those divine characteristics Rebuild in the scripture is our greatest challenge. What kind of mental picture do we have of God? The danger we all face in our thoughts about God is that we tend to recreate God in our own image of him rather than seeing God as he has rebuilt himself in scripture. Too often our thoughts about God are adjusted to our own desires rather than adjusting our thinking to see God as He is. When we adjust our concept of God to conform to our own thinking, we end up with a distorted, inaccurate view of God. We may end up believing in the kind of God that we wish to believe in while disliking and rejecting the God we refuse to know and understand. 
we may end up creating God into whatever we want him to be. When the children of Israel made a molten calf in the wilderness, it wasn't that they were completely rejecting God, but they wanted to recreate him in their own image of him. Notice what Moses wrote in Exodus 32, verse 1 to 6. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earring, which are in the ears of your wives, your son, and your daughter, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands, and he fashioned it with an engraving tools, and made a golden cup. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offering, and brought peace offering, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. When the molten cup was made, they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. It was not a complete rejection. They attempted to create God in their own thinking of him. If we spend our lives trying to fit God into the pattern we think we ought to follow, then we have done the same thing. The Israelites did in the wilderness when they shaped their God into a molten cup. An inadequate view of God is the root of many sins. Wrong thought about God in the Garden of Eden led to the fall of men. The only hope of transforming our lives and our world is through coming to know God as He is revealed in the Scripture. The truly great men and women throughout history are those that devoted themselves to a study of God's character. Seeing God as He is has to do with knowing God's way and His character. How else can you know any person? Knowing a person goes beyond knowing what they look like. It involves knowing their characters and their ways. In Exodus 12, 33, verse 12 to 17, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the world? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Amen. 
we see here Moses long to see God. And God answered Moses' prayer. God descended in a cloud and passed in front of Moses. And God stressed his character trait. We see that in Exodus 34, verse 5 to 8. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, is low to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generations. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Look at, at God's brilliance would be as blinding as looking at the sun. Yet God's character is where God's real glory shines. So God tells Moses to for of his grace, compassion, loving kindness, and his holiness and justice. This attribute reveals God's glory. Unless we know of the attributes of God's character, we cannot know and worship God. No wonder that Moses bowed to the ground when God revealed his character traits. It is God's attribute that demands our attentions. It is only when we come to know God's attributes that we can bow in humble adorations. God's attributes are the description of who he is. Knowing God's character is the very basis of our faith and trust in God. Knowing that God's grace is wholeheartedly governed by his commitment to compassion, love, holiness, and justice in every circumstances is the very basis of our relationship with him. This is especially important when we don't understand the why behind what is happening in those times our faith in the character of god enable us to trust that he is doing what is best in every circumstances this is why it is important for us to see god as he is knowing god's characters give us a new perspective on life we begin to view life from God's perspective. Nothing will more radically change the way we look at life and circumstances than seeing God as He is. Understanding God's character is the basis of all morality. People today do not want a God who makes demands and interferes with our personal business, especially in the area of sex and money. Every time we began to lose sight of God, we begin to do what we believe to be right in our own eyes. Our culture rejects the idea of moral absolute because we have lost sight of the God of Scripture. Many say they believe in a God of love, not a God of law. We have ceased to founder the moral perfections of God. Our spiritual growth is depend on seeing God as He is. There is absolutely no way we can enjoy the presence of God in our lives without allowing the presence of His character to be manifested in every face of our lives. This is what spiritual growth is all about. Allowing God to manifest His glory through our lives as we seek to be like Him. 
and this is the only real means of reaching the lost. Brothers and sisters, how we see God is different from me to you and to others. That's depend on how much we know Him according to the scripture, how deep our relationship to Him. Let's not create God in our own view like the Israelites did before, but see Him as He is according to the scripture in order to have the right view of who He really is. Let's continue to seek His face until we see Him face to face. Amen. Come let us love for He said You have Yeah.
heart cry of ours as your bride, the bride of your son, whom you're getting ready to return. May this prayer, may this pledge become so real to us individually and corporately. That Lord God, we're not just singing some melody and some verbiage and some lyrics but that this is so real and so true within our hearts and that our pledge and our promise I will love you is burning within every part of our being that we will never ever be the same again without understanding this pledge and this promise that I will love you regardless of circumstance regardless of difficulties regardless of challenges like God your love overwhelms all of this and so we pray again today I will love you. All that I am. All that I have. I will love you. May you be honored tonight or today, Father. May you be blessed. May you be worshipped from the lips of all that led us in worship, from the lips of our own congregation, from the lips of of a heart that willingly and lovingly loves you truly, honestly. That we're not about just having a conversation or just a sounding nice prayer, but we're all about the truth that is in our heart. That we do love you because you have loved us with such an everlasting love that you have shown us more than we could ever, ever comprehend, neither understand. That your love is so real. Your love is so true. Your love is so perfect that fear can no longer touch our lives. We thank you, Lord, for what you will do today in the midst of us. We thank you for what you have done. And we thank you for all that you're doing in the midst of us. May you be glorified. May you deserve all our praise. Lord, we just adore you. There's really not enough words in the language that we know that can ever express how much we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys. That was wonderful. Amen. Amen. Hello. How, how are you? <laughs> I haven't seen you forever. <laughs> uh, but all is really good. God is really good. Uh, and, um, um, you know, I, I was listening to some of the, to many of the testimonies, and wow, to God be the glory. But, um, so today, I, what I'd like to share would really be um, just for us to have an understanding of what this is all about, you know, after after a conference, after a mission trip. I'm like, what is it all about? And we talked about a little bit of, uh, uh, about that in, in one of the posts, I think. I don't remember anymore when. <laughs> it's been so long ago. Um, by the way, my trip to London and to uh, Vienna was really powerful, really good, wonderful. But um, uh, I'm still... I really believe because, you know, people were saying, 
how can you do that? Well, I can't. I mean, on my own, I really can't do that. I really can't do a back-to-back trip like that, you know, or nonstop. But by the grace of God, we can do all things. Nothing is impossible with God. Okay. And for me, just to, you know, I mean, I'm not Superman. I'm not Superwoman. I'm just a person who understands how to move with God. And uh, um, I could have said, you know, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't go to UK. Maybe I shouldn't go to Vienna. Maybe I shouldn't do that. My mind can say that to me, but I did not allow me to say that to me because that will... Um, we all know, you know, uh, the, the things of God are, are not easy to compute. The, the, the ways of God are not easy to really comprehend with our naturality. It can only be discerned by the Spirit of God. And uh, I didn't understand, you know, how I'm going to be able to maneuver that. But towards the end, well, I think it was just yesterday or the other day. I think I was talking to Christine and I just saw that I just saw that on that trip, I was just being carried by the spirit of God, by the presence of God, by the anointing. I was literally just being carried because there were opportunities to be tired. There were op- you know, the, 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 the trip was long and uh, going to one aircraft to another to, uh, you know, is it, they're long. And they're tiring. But I really saw that um, a a supernatural presence of God was there for me. That's all I can say. Because, you know, physically, uh, it was not very easy to do. We could try. But, you know, but what what I sensed, what I saw was that um, the anointing from the Philippines carried me to UK and all the way to Vienna. It was not several trips and it was not several uh, conferences. It was one whole batch. And so the anointing was still there uh, from the obedience that we did, you know, from what we did, what uh, we allowed God to do through us in the Philippines, that substance, that anointing carried me to UK and do all of those proclamations. I'll talk about that another time. And then to Vienna and to show me what, why I was there and what for and so on and so forth. And, but I think most, most of all, what I saw there what I am a witness to is that uh, it is time for us to really continue to move in the spirit. That God is going to allow us to do supernatural things if we do not allow our computations, our rationalizations, our, uh, our body speaking to us, and so on and so forth. Some of those, you know, it speaks to us. That, that there is an opportunity for us to, to really walk in the supernatural of God. And I believe where I've been is and was a supernatural walk with God. And I, I cannot explain, but I, I just know that there was that powerful presence of God everywhere, anywhere that I went that it did not matter that this was a hard walk to go over there or this is a hard situation over here uh, that, you know, my, my, because we were billeted in a hostel in, in Vienna that they did not have soap. <laughs> they did not have all of those, you know, toiletries and thank God I had a soap, <laughs> Uh, but did not bring my, my shampoo. And so, okay, let's just do the shampoo when we go home. <laughs> Those kind of, you know, and, and people of different uh, races and different uh, culture. And of course, uh, one of the wonderful blessing was that I finally met uh, Howard and, uh, and uh, Mike. And that was, you know, Wonderful and beautiful and very interesting. So anyways, but, uh, you know, all in all, what I'd like to say for us today is because, you know, you, you, you listen to the testimonies of, of many of you amongst you, those of you who went, those of you who didn't go, 
I mean, you had testimonies. You have, you have experienced what we have experienced in the Philippines. Maybe not not as much uh, tangibility as if you're present, but it was it was life changing, wasn't it? My life will never be the same. And I'm sure all of you, all of us in this little little house of God, uh, has been changed. Uh, Sister Lilita was just, you know, giving me numbers of, of, of what we spent. And it doesn't matter. That is, that is nothing compared to the lives that were changed. They were precious. The lives that were touched by God. It was precious. I mean, there's no valuation to that. That they changed lives and what they will carry going forward. The investment that was vested upon them and upon, you know, the people that were part and um, uh, were, were uh, in, in, in these conferences, were, they were worth it. We just, we just gave our money and our time. Jesus gave his life. Jesus shed his blood for these same people that he allowed us to touch. And to be touched. And, uh, and one of the, you know, I listened to some of, especially the locos, the, the young people. I mean, they were, they were just so powerful. And I, I cried and cried and cried because not, because not only because of the wonderful things that God has done into their lives, but because of the accountability and the responsibility that I am now have to discern how to go about that my life now and your lives will not have to be the same. That every, you know, what I would always say this, your, your individual lifestyle will affect other people. And there you go. You saw a demonstration of that. I mean, you know, uh, before going, we, we kind of said this and said that. Uh, to be prepared, you know, to to really put our trust in God and and you know just 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 all that uh, training and all that uh, exhortation for that one event. I don't know about you, but I felt like I gave my whole life for that one event, and that one event. Is not just an ordinary event. It was an event that God has set up for us for the next succeeding events. And so the past two days I have been posting um, on Be Clothed with Power from on High, the life that manifests the fragrance of God. It is. When he said to me during the Kabayan conference, when he said to me, I want to touch people. I knew that we'll, we'll have to forego all that we think we want to do for our program, for the program of the one. And uh, you will notice it really touched people. It really did touch people. It, it, you know, I'm, I had nothing to do with whatever happened. It's everything that God wanted done. And the wonderful thing is, you know, we've been... We've been, we've been graced so in, in such a way that we were able to flow with what he wanted done. And, and I, you know, I will show us, which you have read yesterday and today's post from John 15, verse 12. Take a look at, let's take a look at that scripture. John 15, verse 12. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And, you know, this is the same sequel. This is the same. Um, he's reiterating what he said in John 13. What did he say in John 13? He said, uh, which, uh, he, he said, what did I say? Can, can you put me back there? I think I, did I write it? Or is it on the other side? Okay, anyways, just, let's just follow what I said, because then, you know, so, yeah, John 13, 35, by this all will know, all will know, not just some, 
all who has seen the demonstration of God through us, through you, will know that uh, you are my disciples. Do you know how important that is? You are mine. By this, the, all will know that you are my disciples if you love, have loved one for another. And uh, we will look at that uh, uh, next. So it is critical. And uh, so I asked the question, what is a life that manifests this fragrance? What is that life? What is that fragrance? Why is it critical to manifest this fragrance in these end times? So it is critical that it, if it utmost of utmost importance that the fragrance of Jesus be made manifest first in his bride and people, and then, of course, into the world. Then his bride and people manifest his fragrance to the world. Yeah? Next. And then, you know. So we, we see this in Romans 8, that um, it's, it's not just us as a bride of Jesus Christ, or as a church of Jesus Christ, or as an ecclesia, or even as a people of God, however category we might allow ourselves to belong, like sons and daughters of God, I mean, our body of Christ, uh, um, warriors of God, family of God, wherever category it is, it, it, we, we, we have that cry, and um uh, but we also must understand that in Romans 8, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe. I mean, watching, tiptoe. You know, you know when you're tiptoeing, it means you don't want to disturb anything that is present or don't want to disturb anyone who's sleeping or uh, being quiet. So yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of sin. All right, next. But now, with eager expectation, now, even us, with eager expectation, but really we're going to be talking about the creation. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Uh, we have such a freedom as children of God, as people of God, as redeemed of God. All right. Which other, other, other than that, nobody has that freedom. They're still, they're still uh, slaved to the decay. Decay is the result of sin and sinfulness. Okay, and uh, to this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation. So creation is groaning. I mean, uh, the, the government, the, the, uh, the people, uh, those that are, in, um, are focused on uh, global, uh, what was that? Globalization, uh, climate change, etc. Think that it is the cry th that that's the cry of creation, but this is just the cry of creation. Global, global, uh, what do you call it again? Climate change is really the cry of God's creation. And so we see it here. Uh, to this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in contractions of labor for childbirth. Let's keep going and then we'll explain that. And it's not just creation. So, so creation is doing that. But it's not just creation. We, we who have already experienced the first uh, fruits of the Spirit also inwardly, we groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters or as, as bride of Jesus Christ, including our physical bodies in being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation, the groaning, the crying. We, we're looking to that to see the ultimate uh, uh, revelation of, of what it is to be freed from the confines of sin. For this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. We've seen some. When uh, we'll probably see some more, but there's still a lot of unseen that we haven't seen. <laughs> you know, for why would we need to hope for something we already have? 
And, and that's really pertaining to, you know, some people say, well, you're already saved. And some of the, some of this uh, uh, super grace teaching tells us that you don't need to do anything, you know. And that's another topic. So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And it takes a bracing up and an understanding of, of this hope. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, our hope is not just a wish, I wish, I wish the hope, you know, but our hope is based on the tangibility and the reality of our faith based on what Jesus already done and already what he has promised and what he's continually allowing us to see as a revelation in our lives. Amen. Next, Jeremy. So, I say this, so this cry includes for now, most specifically, the manifestation of the fragrance of his presence and his glory. And uh, this is where I'd like to really bring us home to understand where we have been. Yeah, wonderful testimonies. Yeah, you know. And, and every, every testimony that has... Um, a life-changing opportunity that was spoken is is makes me makes me makes me hold on and be sobered because it's easy to express what you have felt at a moment when the anointing is so strong and so powerful, and even way after, be able to narrate that, be able to verbalize that and be able to really, and, 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 and many of those cases, those are real and those are true. And I do not doubt that because, you know, when God touches you, I mean, you will experience something that you've never experienced before, but to, to have an understanding of that and to walk in a sustained faith and a sustained obedience to do that is going to be another thing. You understand? And that's why even, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I know they all kind of, oh, Pastor Linda, Pastor Linda, I, yeah, just I cringe for that because it's not really me. But of course, I, somebody had to be used, you know, someone has to yield to God to do whatever he needed to do. And us, you know, being the ones uh, hosting the conference, we had to walk in in a way that is really i mean there was so much discerning to do that there was so much you know uh it was not an easy thing to do but uh, the 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 beautiful thing about about that whole event was that we have been trained to individually and hopefully together, which I think I saw the evidence that, you know, we have unity, we have understanding, and you trusted me to just move in the way that the Lord wants us to move. And so that whatever uh, God wants done, uh, as, as the people cry, you see, I keep saying this to you guys, even before, the Lord has um, wonderfully trained me in that I can, I will, I'm not confined to my notes. But I have become the note. <laughs> and so, but that requires a lot of, uh, many of that manifestation, many of that, uh, you know, what I'm saying is God can move in anybody, but it, the level of that move is going to be according to how you are with him. What is, your, what is your intimacy? What is your place with him? What has he done to you internally, mentally, soullessly, and physically? And, uh, and that's what a lot of the people saw. Um, and, um, you know, what I'd like for us to see 
from that vantage point is that God can really do something to change someone's life when we allow him to do it. And that's why we, we premised the conference with this is not your regular conference. And I didn't even know that he was going to do what he did. But I just was knowing that we were conscious that we're not just doing this for, you know, or whatever a regular uh, conference would, would have done. And um, for our, our benefit of understanding, I also want us to know that we did invest with our individual lives and corporate life as a body, as a church. We did invest. And we did allow the love of God to really be released through us. And that, it, it, that means also, you know, we were willing to give of our substance, of our money, of our resources. I will tell you, and you know, we don't have a huge bank account, but we have God to account for us. And I just want that. That's the other change of paradigm that I wanted us to understand that has come upon us. That we were not held back by the littleness of our resources. We held on to the hugeness and the vastness of God's resources towards us because as Lilita was giving me this number and I said, where did we get that? <laughs> How did that happen? God happened to us. And so I, I just want us to take a look at that because that's, that's when the fragrance here, yeah, this cry includes for now, more specifically manifestation of the fragrance of his presence and his glory. What is that? We allowed God to release through us his fragrance. A smell, a scent, a presence that did touch people. I mean, it touched me tremendously. Amen. So I was just saying, I'm going to be doing this. So next, the next, the next post. So the command to love is putting God's glory on display. So uh, a life that manifests the fragrance of God is a life that manifests the love of God. I mean, you look at Emil. Emil was kind of not very happy, you know. He was feeling the pain. But he kind of just endured it and trusted God that he would see it through. So we went... And did what God commanded us to do. And that is so powerful. Because it's not easy to obey, especially if you have to put money. It's not easy to obey, especially if you have, put, to, have put, to put your own time and your own effort. It wasn't easy. Most, most, most of you had to uh, undergo the, the jet lag. But you know what? God gave us a supernatural ability to even move through and even in the face of jet lag. Although some overslept, but that was okay. <laughs> but, but there was the supernatural. What I'd like to, to, to draw our attention into is there is a supernatural manifestation of God there, even physically. I mean, before you came, we even did a 12-hour prayer. <laughs> and for me, that was, okay, God, this is, you know, fueled by grace, <laughs> fueled by anointing. And people were touched that, you know, you guys can do 12-hour prayer. Why not? Like, you know, it's, why not? But that's part of who we are as a people. That's part of how we have displayed and demonstrated the love of God. The love of God is never just a conversation or just a word of mouth. It is an active acting upon that love 
that brings us the supernaturality of God. Um, I actually this message is a takeoff from uh, the, the 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 teaching of um, Mike. But let me just share with you what he said. Now let's go first to yeah yeah. He said uh, because everything that's in this in this in his teaching is exactly what you know what I knew was what God was doing for for our purpose to understand. What was that display of God's glory? Because he displayed his glory. He displayed his glory. He did not just have his presence, but he had his glory. And those two things are, are two different things, although we interchange presence and glory. But the presence is, you know, the promise of God to be with you. But the glory is when he wants to invade you and bring himself and everything that he is in the midst of us. So he's glorified. Amen. And so this is what he said. Um, uh, bring me first to John. We said, we saw John, John 15 and then John 13, 35 and then John 17, 23. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So we said, we saw this. No, just just the verse, John 15. Because I want you to see it from another perspective. I want you to see it from what God has done. All right? So this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So I kept, I kept saying that to us, that this is not really a new commandment. But the expression of this commandment is new in that the reference point of our love for others is the reference from which we were loved. How, how much have you experienced the love of God is how much you will, it will, will give out that love or act, in, uh, act that love and be activated in this love. How much have you experienced the love of God is how much you will give it. Because you can only give that which is in you. And not only that, you can only give that kind of love that is real to you. That is evidenced in you. Amen? It's not just something that just you, you thought. It's not just something that everybody had to say. But it is a love that you understand that will break through and will change lives. That's, that's what he's saying. Next, next. John 13, 35, by this, we said this earlier, all will know, all will know. It will affect people. It will affect situation. It will affect finances. It will affect nation. It will affect the world. And it will affect the way God is going to be able to release his manifestation of himself on the earth. If you have love for one another, that is so powerful. And it begins here. In this body, begins here, begins with you, begins with me. How, how much do I love Ted? How much do I love Rendu? How much do I love, uh, I love you? Is how much I take care of myself to be obedient to God, to walk in that, you know, that calling. Because what I do here affects you and what we do together affects them. And what them would do together with us will affect the nation and the world. Who knows what God was able to do in the atmosphere of the Philippines, in the atmosphere in Palawan. And, and that's the far reaching thought that I'd like for you to comprehend. It's not just a way, you know, that's why I wanted us to be sober. Even when we did see a lot of wonderful things, we did see a lot of beautiful things. We did spend a lot of money and time and effort and, and friendship and all that. But what I'd like for us to understand is that, you know, this is very sobering because there is accountability for this. And because God would have, we don't know the far reaching effect of what God has done. But definitely he doesn't do anything that will not have an effect. I mean, we just heard some of those that made, made those testimonies and those wonderful things that God has done for them. But what has, 
but, and th those were wonderful, especially because they're testifying of it. But what did that do in a more comprehensive way for the Philippines, for the Filipinos, for the nations, and for the world, and for the plan of God? Amen. And so the other thing there is that the importance of how our lives, it is a lifestyle that was demonstrated on that event. Your lifestyle, how you lived. It was not just because Gio looks cute and was really in the drums beating with God, but because it is the glory of the Lord. And I was very careful that when they're falling, that they don't think they're falling is it. No, falling under the power is not it. It's when you get up. How are you going to be? Because I've seen a lot of that falling and a lot of the, you know, and, and I was careful to exhort them. It's not about the falling. It's about, you know, yeah. And I, you know, I was careful not to just, lay hands on anybody so that they will fall. Because I know with the, whatever I was carrying, that if, if I just pass by them, they will fall. And so, you know, the manifestation of God's presence. Next, the next. John 17, 23, Jesus was very explicit. I in them, him in us. That's where we were. He was in us. And you and me, there was that symbiotic relationship that they may be made perfect in one. The unity was gelled by the love that we understand for God and for each other and for the purpose of those that we were sent to, do, to, to, to be with. And that the world may know, again, the world needs to know. And we are so privileged to allow the world to know. Maybe through the same people around us. But you listen to the testimony of the brother of Abigail. I mean, you know, when I was talking to him, it was really just, yeah. And that's, he is a sample of the world. And they know that you have sent me, that we were sent to the Philippines. That we were apostolically sent over there and, and, uh, and have loved them as you have loved me. We've loved the people as we have been loved by God, as we have been loved by Jesus. And this is really a very deep expression of what Jesus is saying, but sufficient for us today just to do that. That you and I, we carry the love of God for a people we don't even know. We carry the love of God for people we didn't even, you know, we have no idea. But we, we went anyways because we understood that God is going to do something. Maybe we don't understand it as deeply and as, you know, fully as we should, but we did though. We allowed our hearts to be filled with the love of God and express that. Do you guys understand it? That's why when we had to, uh, when some of the young people in Catanduanes was really, you know, rearing, because we, we're not knowing what God was doing to them before they even came. And for that desire, and for that wanting, for that hunger. And so for them to be able to be part of what we were doing, I mean, we had to invest on them. And, and, and you know, we send them money, we send them this, and some of the other people in my class on Tuesday and Friday gave and invested and so on and so forth. And it was wonderful. And look what, what God was able to do in their lives. They're still right now, not nonstop, they're still preaching the gospel. They're still reaching out to other people. They're still being a witness. And so the same thing, hopefully, for the ones in Ilocos, you know, and, and I, I just feel like, oh, God, you know, thank you. And even while we were in Kabayan, because it, it, was, it was massive. 
every morning there were these people who needed to have breakfast and they didn't have breakfast. So, okay, go have breakfast. I mean, I can compute it. Hey, you're not part of the breakfast. No, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I really held on. I, 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 I kind of uh, uh, guarded my heart. Every instant, every moment, I guarded my heart not to go there because I know whatever we had to do uh, naturally is going to be, will, will affect the whole event, the whole uh, conference and what God will do. And so I was careful. Uh, this guy need money. Okay, give him money. This guy need food. Give him food. Let's, you know, and and we were watchful. I mean, I I just love Alan's sensitivity too. That you know, knowing that some of the young people didn't have really that much money. So every time we have an extra food, and we we put it together and we deliver it to them. You know, that's love. That's thoughtfulness. And, and, and the totality of all that we had to do, and we did, and we watched ourselves in how we did things, contributed to the totality of what God wanted to do, and will still be doing, and is still be, being done. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? And, and that's the power of the love of God. You knowing it. So... Here, let me just say, read to you what uh, Mike was saying. That's why I love this guy. Because he can think like I think. He's saying, a life that manifests the fragrance of God. We will look at the verse about being fragrance of God. The nature and purpose of fragrance is to attract. Right? I mean, you're dispelled when you smell a foul fragrance, right? They go, oh, you know, you, you, you stay away. But when there is, when you smell a fragrance that is soothing and powerful, you're drawn to it. What do you have? I mean, what's that fragrance, you know? And so the, uh, the, he's saying the, the nature and purpose of fragrance is to attract. It is to wow and woo. Wow is, whoa. And who is, come on, it draws, it courts you, you know, as another woo. And to awaken and to steer the heart. The Lord says that there is a lifestyle in which God's fragrance is actually manifested through us. It's the lifestyle I was telling you about. I don't think we will see the same move of God if we were wishy-washy in our lifestyle. That's why I was very careful to remind us, hey, you don't want to bring to the Philippines your yuck. You remember that? Because that's, that's a smell that is foul. We want to bring to them the fragrance of God's presence and God's glory that is coming out of our personal relationship with God expressing that love it, it, it doesn't mean you know big love or this but the true love that we have carried and so the lord says that there is a lifestyle in which god's fragrance is actually manifested through us it will attract and woo and wow believers unbelievers and angels as well even the Lord himself is attracted to the lifestyle that says yes to him in this way. You know, we, we did not have hype. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? It, it was not just hype. It was real. The presence of God was so tangible. I mean, you could, you could touch him. <laughs> right? You, you, you could just touch him. And people was just touched by his presence. So he was saying, we are going, and, and this is what we're going to do. We are going to look at the all too familiar commandment to love and what I want you to see tonight or today, which is we're going to look at the context of this love. His people to love command, God commands his people to love. It is a command. And yet, 
One of the things I have realized is that people, the people of God have yet to encounter the love of God. That most people know the love of God, but they have no reality of that love. Neither have they been encountered by that love enough to change their paradigm, enough to change their emotion, enough to change their priorities and their choices. And there is an encounter of love that changes your whole paradigm. You may not be perfect walking into that yet, but it, it changes you. Your priorities change. Your choices change. Your mindset changes. And the expression of that love is magnificent and powerful. And so he's saying it is the way that God puts his glory on display to the unbelieving world. And not only that, it is the way that God has chosen to usher us into a supernatural quality in our inner life. The Lord says, as we were, if you will exert yourself in the grace of God to love that dynamic process that is challenging in the flesh, it will little by little, usher your inner man into a supernatural lifestyle. It's a supernatural lifestyle. So what did he say here? So what is the command to us? us uh, what is our battle cry? What is our mission and our vision? That you love God. Take me there, Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Jesus said to him, this is to the, the lawyers and to the Pharisees that were testing him and just giving him a query. But already they knew this because this is also, you know, already narrated in Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 4. I mean, over and over in Leviticus, you know, the love of God was, was paramount to the Israelites. But for us today, Jesus continued to say to us, you shall love the Lord with all your heart. And I don't want you to just be familiar with that, but I want this, this commandment of Jesus to really sink into our heart enough to just, you know, revolutionize the way we think and burn our hearts with passion for this love. All right. Uh, with all your heart, with all your soul. Is there anything else reserved for anything? All, all means all. It's a wholehearted giving of ourselves to God and with all your mind. What? This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, the second is the manifestation of the first. Becomes the overflow. And, you know, I'm not just talking about the second commandment, you know, uh, just uh, as an example for, for what happened in the conference. But this is our lifestyle. That you love others. And that's why Jesus was very, uh, very, um, uh, you know, uh, very serious in saying to, in the Sermon of the Mount, in, in, in uh, Luke 6.38, no, not Luke 6.38, but um, wherever that is, he says, love your enemies. Yeah. Matthew 5, right? Yeah. Six and seven, all of those chapters are really interrelated. It was just one conversation. It was just one teaching. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Hello. That is unthinkable to your, to your natural mind. But to someone who has encountered love and has been invaded by love, this is so doable. He has no struggle. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. That's another impossibility insofar as the parameter of the world is concerned. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Hello. Let me see verse 45. What does it say in verse 45? That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Why? Because he's this way. This is how he is. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, we're not, 
we're, we're precious to God because we're saved by the blood of Jesus. But he's also equally precious to the unsaved because Jesus also died for them. They just don't know it. They just haven't had the opportunity to understand what already has been done for them. That they don't have to be a, a slave to fear, slave to sin and the ways of the world. But they have been set free positionally. But unless you accept that and acknowledge what Jesus has done for you, you will not experience the benefit of what is done on the cross. And that's, he's talking about you. You, all of us here in this book. Who is benefiting from the fragrance of God into your life? Who is, is, who is being wooed and wowed by your lifestyle? We did see the effects of that in Manila and in Palawan. Can you imagine if all of us in the body of Christ would allow him to really move through us, his way, his timing, his purposes, his money, his resources. That's going to be powerful. That's why Jesus is saying, the world indeed shall know that you are my disciple because you are mine, because you follow me, because you look like me, you rightly represent me according to how I want you to present me and represent me, the world will see this. They will like me through you because you rightly express the fragrance of who I am. That's what brings change. That's what brings transformation. Not the eloquence of our preaching, not the many scriptures that we quote and we preach and we know, but the lifestyle that we're able to manifest to the world and display the glory of God is what makes a difference. And in the end times, this is going to be warred off. I mean, against the war of the enemy is going to uh, come against this kind of love because it will be tried. I mean, are we going to just love them because they're lovable? Of course not. You love them that are lovable. But how are we going to be when they are not lovable to us? When they accuse you. When they persecute you. When they misinterpret you. When they twist your words. When they malign you. Are you gonna, how are we going to be? But the essence, the power of that love, that's why it has to, we must encounter love because love is a person. Love is a person. The fragrance of his love draws people to him. I mean, the 12 disciples, I mean, Jesus had, all Jesus had to say, not even had to convince them. All Jesus had to say, come follow me. And they went. Left everything. Amen. And this is part of, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, what is that fragrance? Let me just continue and then we'll end somewhere here. Second uh, Corinthians 2, 14, 15. Let, uh, let's go there because that's really where this whole teaching is going to hinge from and all the others. But these are the specific ones. In verse 14, this is Paul. I mean, he had said a lot of things, but in verse 14, because of, you know, there was a lot of things. And we, maybe next, next Sunday we'll look into that. Oh, no, next Sunday we'll start the Israel prayer. Now, thanks be to God who always, not every now and then, not whenever you're nice or you're good, but he always leads us in triumph. In Christ. And the word Christ there is Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Christ there is the anointing and the anointed one. Okay. We, that's our tri where our, we triumph in the anointing of the Christ, the Son of the living God. And through us, through us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. In the conference, 
We allowed God through us to diffuse, to release his fragrance. And people were touched, not because we're great, but because God showed up. God showed up. God was present. God's glory was present and was really touching people. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, the fragrance of the anointing on the anointed one, Jesus, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So this is the lifestyle that releases a fragrance that attracts people. Amen. And that's why uh, in, in, our, in the next, uh, whatever is next for us, <laughs> which is really not contingent to because we're going to have a conference or we're going somewhere in a mission. But what is next for us from here is going to require us to go up higher. That's why I say I'm sober because it's an accountability. It is a privilege, but it is also, you know, something that God is going to require more for us. And because we think of those that we enjoy their testimony. We think of them and their lives, the continuance, you know, the consistency of where they will be going is also contingent on how we live our lifestyle. Not from here, but from a higher place. That's the requirement of that. And, you know, it's not going to be easy. I'm not going to say that to you, it's easy. There's going to be warfare, as always, you know, and we need to... Uh, allow ourselves to be resigned to the fact that we are in a fight every day of our lives. Whether we're laughing or we're crying, whatever we're doing, there is a fight. And the unfortunate thing about this fight is that we can't see our enemy. And many times we're oblivious that we have an invisible enemy. And that that invisible enemy of ours has a a, uh, has an advantage because we don't see them unless you discern in the spirit that we wrestle not with flesh and blood but with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places but let's be honest you know how many times do we think do we look behind what is provoking that person in anger or in accusation about against you and we always look at the person Uh, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We always look at the person instead of looking behind, you know, the invisible spirit that provokes that person, that uses whatever in that person's life is ab- uh, that they're able to hold on to and release it and make havoc. Amen. And, and this is the consciousness that we have. Because, you know, during the conference, it was easy also to look at, look at the natural, look at the, you know, there were, there were a lot of opportunity to, uh, for us to be distracted by here, by that. But, you know, I, my prayer was, no, we're not going to go there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they're doing. What matters is what are we going to do? Will I waste my anointing to this teeny weeny conversation here that uh, is annoying. No, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to central center myself into the presence of a holy God. Because what he wants to do and what he wants done and how he wants to touch lives is going to be more, more, more important than all of these yanky, yanky things that's going on in the, in the situation, in, in our circumstance, you know. You guys understand what I'm saying? And you, you have experienced them, right? I mean, music team. I mean, the, a meal with his feet. I mean, it was, it was, it was there, available. But the wonderful thing is God sheltered us 
not to go there. And of course, all that begins with me. Because I'm kind of, you know, heading this thing. It begins with me. I mean, there were a lot of times I, I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't really rest properly. But I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to explain. I'm just going to walk exactly how God wants me to walk. And that's the fragrance. That's what attracted the presence of God. Because, you know, his presence also is attracted to what we do, how we do things. Amen? So, yeah. It, it's very sobering, right? And I know what I'm preaching is not uh, very easy to comprehend, but just for us to have a bit of understanding on what this conference was all about. It's about the manifestation of the glory of God and, and the fragrance of his knowledge being expressed through us. Because we are vessels. We are containers of God. And as we allow ourselves to be filled with his presence. That's why you remember the, past, the, the, the last month, I think, uh, we were really just teaching on let's walk in the spirit. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? What is the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Amen. And, and he was just there, present for all of us. Amen. So come, come up and let's end here. And I'm just thankful for all, all of you, those who went and those who stayed. Thank you so much. You know, I just, you know, I'm so, so, so blessed that we stood together. Uh, we, those of you who stayed behind, you, you know, you undergirded us with your prayer and your life and your lifestyle. And those of, uh, those of us who went, we also, you know, felt all your presence. Amen. We will continue this maybe after the, um, after the uh, 21 day fasting and praying. So from here, we, we change course, but not really changing course, but just flowing in the course that God wants us to be. And even this 21-day fasting and praying is going to be so pivotal in the seasons and in the timings of God for us all. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. For your glory. We continue to uh, repeat the stand of Moses. That if your glory does not come with us, we don't want to go anywhere. And we continue to pray that we will understand what that means. That we will allow your presence and your glory to encounter us. That we will not be careless, neither be oblivious of the beauty of your holiness. That we will allow you to be grand and majestic in the midst of us. That we will allow your fragrance to be diffused in the environment that we move in, in the community where we live, in the city that we live, in the nation to which you have assigned us, and to the world. And we're grateful, Father. We say again, eyes has not seen and ears not heard. And the mind has not comprehended the things that you have prepared for those who love you. And we're grateful, Abba. Continue to allow us to see each other with your eyes. 
continue to allow the love that is welling within us to be savored, to be tasted by the world and for your fragrance to be smelled. Your fragrance may woo them and wow them and attract them to you. For you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that truth, you will continue to build us that not even in the strength and in the power, that not even the gates of hell shall prevail against us. And we thank you for continually pouring unto us, Lord God, an understanding of your love, a craving for your love, the real love, the love that never changed, the love that never fails, the love that is willing to die even on a cross and shed his blood, the love of God, shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Abba, for today. Honor you and we bless you. And to those online, we just say to you, we pray that the craving and desire to encounter this love may come upon you right now, wherever you are, however you are, you have been, whatever your situation may be. And whenever you listen to this broadcast, this powerful anointing that's being released here today is going to be resident and that you will know it and you will be changed by it. And we pray. In Jesus' name, that you will be arrested by the fragrance of the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we release the face of God to shine upon your faces and lifting up his countenance on us and giving us grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. I don't know how to say exactly
every drop is gone I pour my love on you yes God we just want to pour out all our love on you in the same way that you lavished and you that you poured out your own love to us we want to respond in the same way that with every single drop that we have no matter how little or how many it may be we just want to give it all to you because you deserve it all we thank you god for this message today may it touch the depths of our hearts and i pray that we may be more conscious lord as to what it means to carry your fragrance as we live and walk in this world we thank you god for everything we just want to continue to bask in your presence and in your love today we glorify you in jesus name we pray